Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, dislocations as we saw can glide on the slip plane, but additional to that they can actually leave the slip plane and uh, it depends on the type of dislocation to decide what kind of a mechanism by which they would leave the slip plane. An edge dislocation can leave the slip plane by a process known as climb, a screw dislocation leaves can leave its slip plane by a process known as cross slip. The fundamental difference between these two mechanisms is that, um, that climb is a non-conservative process and involves mass transport and we will see in the coming slides why this is so. These few process are very very important as far as plastic deformation goes because if a dislocation moving on its slip plane gets stuck at some obstacle then further plastic deformation by uh, further motion of the dislocation would not be possible and then if su su stress is sufficient uh, then some of the other processes like cross slip or climb can take place and thus causing the, uh, the continued motion of the dislocation. Um, of course, we have to remember that uh, uh, in the case of the edge dislocation, the process climb also needs sufficient temperature for mass transport to take place. So, what is meant by the climb of an edge dislocation? So, in this figure for instance, there is an edge dislocation sitting here and the extra half plane of atoms ends here. Now, therefore, the slip plane is the plane which is here as drawn in the figure. Now, the slip plane can move a plane above, suppose my initial slip plane was a plane below, so for instance, let me draw a slip plane here was my original slip plane was here, then it has actually moved a slip plane above, but correspondingly it can also move a slip plane below non th and this can become my new slip plane. So, how does this take place? This means that an entire row of atoms have to either be accommodated that means a row of atoms have to vanish. So, originally there, there would have been a row of atoms here that means the half plane would have ended here and this entire row of atoms have to diffuse into the crystal. So, that you can have a positive climb. So, this is known as the positive climb. Correspondingly, in a negative climb, this entire row of atoms, for instance, this row of atoms here have to diffuse away from the bottom of the uh, half plane, so that the uh, dislocation or sorry, th this other way about wherein the entire row has to come in and take this position, so that the dislocation can climb down. Now, what would happen if a row of atoms uh, were to diffuse out from the center of a crystal, from the edge of this half plane? what would happen is that the vacancy concentration in the crystal would come down and this would enable the climb up of a dislocation. Now, both these processes of uh, either of diffusion in of a row of atoms or a diffusion out of a row of atoms would involve obviously, um, um, high temperatures wherein this would become feasible and therefore, if the dislocation moving on a particular slip plane for instance, suppose this is my slip plane and this is my extra half plane and my dislocation gets stuck at some obstacle then it can move to a slip plane which is parallel and continue its motion. So, this is advantage uh, or this is the role that uh, climb plays in plasticity. So, this is actually simple to understand the process of climb for an edge dislocation, wherein the dislocation moves either one plane parallel to itself up or one plane parallel to itself down. A screw dislocation can leave its slip plane by a process known as cross slip, which has been schematically shown in the diagram here. Um, in this case, uh, you see that the plane first the uh, active slip plane is a blue plane and for now we will as assume that both the blue and green plane are crystallographically equivalent planes and we know that the Burgers vector is to be in this direction which is parallel to the dislocation line. So, as the dislocation line is moving towards this green plane and then it intersects its green plane and for now I will assume there is some reason for instance there could be an obstacle and of course, the obstacle need not be the only reason, but there for instance there could be an obstacle in the slip plane which stops the motion of this dislocation line on the blue plane, then if there is sufficient shear stress on the slip plane too, then the dislocation can actually cross slip 
and leave this blue slip plane and start moving on the green slip plane. So, this process by which a screw dislocation changes its slip plane um, and we have to note here in this case uh, we are not considering the change of a slip system, but merely a slip plane within the slip system then we consider this process as a cross slip process. Of course, if there are competing kind of uh, slip systems then cross slip can also uh, lead to a change of the slip system as well. So, this is a process by which a screw dislocation can leave a slip plane and as you can see as this involves no real mass transport. So, cross slip can easily occur um, provided that there is sufficient stress on the slip planes for continued motion of the dislocation. So, um, we have seen that there are two mechanisms by which a dislocation can leave a slip plane, edge dislocation can leave the, uh, the current slip plane by climb and screw dislocations can leave the current slip plane by cross slip. Now, we ask ourselves another question that we have told and in the previous lectures that uh, a dislocation line cannot end within the crystal. So, where can a dislocation line end? So, a dislocation line can end either on the free surface of a crystal or it can end on an internal surface or an interface and uh, such internal interfaces surfaces could interfaces could be for instance a grain boundary. It can close on itself to form a loop and we will of course, take up some of these loops uh, also and finally, it can end in a uh, in a dislocation reaction where then more than one kind of more than one dislocation line meet and this is called a node. Okay. Um, so, the node is an intersection point of more than two dislocations and we have to note that the vectoral sum of the Burgers vectors of dislocation meeting at a node is 0. So, it is clear that a dislocation line cannot end within the crystal. So, suppose let me do an hypothetical experiment wherein I insert an extra quarter plane of atoms into a material. So, initially what we were doing throughout, throughout was inserting an extra half plane. Suppose I have a crystal here and I insert an extra half plane into this crystal. So, this is my extra half plane for instance. Okay. So, this is my dislocation line this is what I had pointed out. Okay. Now, what if I do not ins so in this case the dislocation line ends on this free surface the front free surface and the back free surface. What if I do not introduce an entire half plane, but I terminate my half plane somewhere in between the crystal. So, I do not end my crystal dislocation there, I end my dislocation line here. So, in other words I do not insert a half plane, but I insert a quarter plane. Now, in this case uh, it seems as if the dislocation is abruptly ending here at this point, but this is not true because what is happening is that this dislocation line actually takes a bend and it leaves it on the top free surface. So, in other words this is one edge dislocation here located and this is another edge dislocation located on this free surface. So, this quarter plane also clearly tells us that a dislocation line cannot end inside the crystal and actually has to end on a free surface. Earlier uh, we had dealt with the concept of positive and negative edge negative dislocations and uh, there are few comments which are noteworthy here in this context. Now, when do we have to consider a positive or a negative edge, uh, dis, uh, edge dislocation is when there are more than one edge dislocation on a slip plane then arbitrarily we assign one of those dislocation as a positive sign and the other as a negative sign. So, a simple example would be suppose I have my uh, slip plane here and I have one dislocation like this another of course, these are the half planes I am showing. So, there is one dislocation here another dislocation here. So, arbitrarily I will call this positive and I will call this negative I could have called them the other way about and if I had just a single dislocation in a slip plane uh, it does not matter what I call it I can call it either positive or negative. So, there is no fundamental difference between a positive and a negative edge dislocation except that it is a way of differentiating more than one dislocation on a slip plane. Now, uh, but this is not true for the sake of uh, for the case of the screw dislocation wherein the right handed screw is structurally different from the left handed screw. So, we have to note that there are two actually two kinds of screw dislocations uh, the right handed screw actually um, if you draw a right handed screw then the dislocation uh, I mean the vector you will actually lead into the plane of the board if you are sitting on a left handed screw then actually you will come out of the plane of the board. So, this is a fundamental difference between a right handed screw and a left handed screw. So, if you call for instance a right handed screw as a negative dislocation and a left handed screw as a positive dislocation we have to remember that structurally the 
uh, positive and the negative uh, screw dislocations are different while in terms of the edge dislocation they are exactly identical as far as the crystal goes. So, this fundamental difference between a positive and a negative uh, edge dislocation in the case of an edge and in the case of screw has to be kept in mind. Next we come to the important topic of energy of dislocations. Now it is clear that uh, a presence of a dislocation distorts the bonds and cause energy to the crystal and um, therefore, a crystal in the presence of a dislocation is associated with the distortion energy. Now, this energy obviously, for a dislocation is expressed in, in units of joules per meter that is uh, energy per unit length of the dislocation line. Now, um, there is a fundamental difference between the edge and the screw dislocation in terms of their kind of stress fields and we will soon see the kind of stress fields they are associated with. The edge dislocation is associated with compressive stress and tensile stress fields while screw dislocations are associated only with shear stress fields and also therefore, the energy associated with the edge or a screw is also different and therefore, they are not exactly equal and therefore, if a dislocation line is not straight. Uh, and if it is bending then the energy per unit length would change from point to point or if you take a small segment uh, along this uh, wherever there is a certain component of edge and screw the energy would be different compared to certain other uh, place in the dislocation line where the uh, amount of screw and edge character changes. Therefore, we have to remember that uh, in any case screw and edge dislocation both are associated with energy and therefore, uh, this energy is responsible for many of the uh, behavior of dislocation we will soon consider. Uh, the energy of a dislocation can be approximately calculated using the linear elastic theory and uh, this linear elastic theory as we had pointed out is valid only uh, to about a few buggers vectors from the dislocation line. Very near the dislocation line which is called the core of the dislocation uh, the uh, uh, linear elastic theory fails and therefore, we cannot calculate the energy accurately here. In those cases, we have to use atomistic methods to actually calculate the uh, energy more accurately wherein we assume certain kind of interatomic potentials. Of course, there are techniques wherein they use even a continuum approach or an um, approach which is similar to the continuum approach to calculate the core energy. But the important thing is that the core energy is about one tenth of the total energy of the dislocation and in many cases can actually be ignored while trying to calculate the uh, total energy of the dislocation. The core region again uh, to reiterate is about between about phi and uh, b and phi b depending on the bonding characteristics of the material and depending on the uh, certain for instance the uh, edge of the screw character of the dislocation. But for most purposes for most common purposes a formula which is given before below here like for instance the energy of dislocation is about goes about as g b square by 2 is more than sufficient for uh, calculating the energy of a dislocation. So, if I look at the uh, total energy of the dislocation, I can divide it into the elastic part and the non-elastic or the core part. The elastic part uh, or the core uh, elastic part is the dominant part of the energy and which is a long range uh, coming from the long range stress fields. The core energy is confined to very close distances uh, near the dislocation line and this energy is about tenth of the uh, total energy of the dislocation and in most cases can be even be ignored. Now, if I look at the formula for the elastic energy of a dislocation per unit length you can see that it is related uh, it is approximately half g b square. Now, um, in other words the elastic energy varies as the square of the Burgers vector. So, this is an important point to note and where b is the modulus of the Burgers vector. So, it is very important to note that therefore, the longer the Burgers vector a dislocation has it the energy will not just be uh, linearly growing it will grow as the square. So, this is a very important point regarding the energy of a dislocation. and uh, from this formula it is clear that if I have a dislocation it will tend to have as small a b as possible. Second thing since it costs me energy to put a dislocation line the dislocation line is associated with some sort of a line tension which is nothing but an other side of viewing of the uh, dislocation energy. And we will also see that because of the presence of this uh, high energy of a dislocation a dislocation may actually split into partials to reduce its uh, energy associated with the dislocation. So, to summarize uh, the uh, energy aspects that there is a distortion of bonds, the distortion of bonds is very severe close to the dislocation line and as you go far away from the dislocation line the distortion is smaller and but nevertheless the energy of the dislocation is spread uh, across a large region in the crystal and the approximately that 
energy of a dislocation can be calculated as approximately as half gb square. There are more accurate formulas for elastic energy calculation, but we will assume for now the formula half gb square. Now, uh, the energy is coming from for instance the compressive and tensile stress fields in the case of an edge dislocation and the shear stress fields in the case of a screw dislocation. And ignoring the uh, core contribution is often not a very serious error in calculating the energy of a dislocation. Because of the dislocation has an energy associated with it, um, it also is associated with the line tension which is another side of the coin of the energy of the dislocation. And because of this, uh, the dislocation would like to have a, as small a b as possible because the energy goes as a square of the Burgers vector and also uh, it would tend to split into partials wherever it is favorable. So, in the case of the cubic closed pack crystals, we will take up an example where the dislocation actually splits into partials. Which dislocation? Um, I quite did not understand your question. So, this is the dislocation energy. Okay. So, this energy can cause the vacancy in the crystal or? Um, uh, I am not quite sure, but actually this energy or this dislocation stress field can actually interact with a vacancy or a interstitial stress field. So, that we will see very soon. So, in terms of a lattice translation, if a dislocation has a, uh, the Burgers vector is a full lattice translation, you call it a full dislocation and if the it is a fraction of the lattice translation you call it a partial dislocation. So, we will soon take up examples of full and partial dislocations especially in the context of cubic closed pack crystals. So, let us consider how a dislocation can actually split and uh, or the split its, uh, its strength and therefore, reduce its energy. So, this is a kind um, suppose I had a dislocation of strength 2 b. Now, the energy of that dislocation would be g into 2 b square by 2 that is in this of course, by the approximate formula and its energy therefore, would be 4 b square by 2. Now, suppose it splits into two halves dislocations of course, these are not partial dislocations as b in this case we can assume is a full lattice translation vector and this is an illustrative example. Therefore, uh, the energy will become um, g into b square twice over. So, you can see that there is a reduction in energy of g b square as the dislocation goes from a Burgers vector 2 b to a Burgers vector of b plus b. So, so, let me write down the energies on the left and right. So, you have energy of about 4 b square by 2 on the left hand side and the right hand side you have got g 2 into b square by 2 therefore, you got b square here and this is 2 b square therefore, the reduction in energy is b square and of course, it scales with b. So, therefore, there is reduction of g b square as this dislocation reaction takes place. Therefore, the forward reaction is energetically favorable and the reverse reaction is not favorable. But, uh, so clearly uh, you cannot have suppose had a slip plane and uh, suppose I can visualize uh, a dislocation with the Burgers vector b, then what I mean by a, is of course, an edge dislocation. What I mean by a dislocation is 2 b is nothing but 2 half planes right and this is not a favorable situation as far as a dislocation goes. So, this presence of this uh, the reduction in energy when a dislocation is split into partials can drive a dissociation of dislocations. Now, let us next consider the stress fields of dislocations and this is a very very important subject because now the stress fields of dislocations are long range stress fields um, and during plastic deformation this stress fields can interact with other stress fields in the material like for instance it can interact with stress fields of other dislocations, it can interact with stress fields of vacancies it can interact with stress fields of coherent precipitates, it can interact with stress fields also with grain boundaries etcetera. So, in various ways the stress field is responsible for the behavior of the dislocation in a material. And when we are talking about stress fields, first of course, we will start with a very ideal kind of situation wherein a dislocation is present in a infinite body. That means, I do not have any surfaces or edges in the body and we will start with the description of an edge dislocation in an infinite body. So, in an infinite body, I can identify a mid plane. For instance, in this diagram, so you can see in my this diagram, this is my mid plane. So, above this mid plane, you can see that, of course, for instance, in this diagram, of course, it is inverse of this, uh, there is uh, in this with reference diagram, there are compressive stress fields on one side of the mid plane and there are tensile stress fields on the other side of the mid plane, and this continues to inf the semi infinity. So, this is how uh, the stress fields are in an edge dislocation in an infinite body. 
Now, these stress fields will be altered if this uh, dislocation is present in a finite body and also it will be altered if this dislocation is an asymmetric position in the crystal. So, these are some things which will alter the stress field of the dislocation. So, this ideal situation would be a dislocation in an infinite body. The second uh, approximation would be that the dislocation is present in a finite body and there will be significant changes in the stress fields of the dislocation and we will take up some of these aspects. And then if the dislocation is present asymmetrically in the body this finite body then that will lead to further alterations in the stress field. So, so let me draw these three cases on the board. So, initial cases of course, I have an infinite body going to infinity in all directions. And I am assuming that the dislocation is present in the body here. In other words, you, you can visualize a slip plane, an extra half plane over here and this is my dislocation. The second case I can consider is this same dislocation in a finite body. So, finite body of course, could be of any arbitrary shape, but I will let me take a simple case and it is a recti uh, uh, either a, uh, a square or rectangular prism or a cylinder and I will assume that the dislocation is present in the center. So, this is the second possibility and of course, in both cases I can draw an extra half plane, but this is now present symmetrically in the body that means the this distance y 1 is same as this distance y 1 and this distance x 1 is same as this distance x 1. But now I can consider so the stress field would be altered as you go from case A which is the infinite case to case B which is the finite case to a case wherein now the dislocation is not only present in a finite body, but it is present asymmetrically in a finite body. So, it is not present right at the center, but in some position which is can be given as x y in the body. So, there will be further alteration with respect to the stress fields as you go to the B and this is finite and this is asymmetric. So, of course, there can be more complications that I can assume a very arbitrarily shaped body and wherein there even there is an absence of any kind of a point of center and I can put it uh, a dislocation somewhere in the body and try to calculate its stress fields. But we will start with the most ideal situation initially, wherein now this dislocation is present in an infinite medium. And when I am talking about these stress fields, I am typically ignoring the uh, what I might call the core region of the dislocation, which cannot be computed uh, using the elasticity theory. So, whatever e equations for instance the equations written below in the formula are all derived using the linear elastic theory and th therefore, the, the validity of these equations is only to about a few buggers vectors from the dislocation line. When you look at these equations for instance, now look at look at the sigma x equation. So, you can clearly see that it depends on the shear modulus of the material and we know that any quantity associated with the dislocation has to be associated with the burgers vector and since now I am talking about edge dislocation, you have a factor 1 minus nu which is coming here and you can clearly see that this uh, dislocation stress field of course, we will understand this in terms of the uh, contour plot of the stresses which is easy to visualize compared to the equation itself. We will see that when I put x equal to 0 and y equal to 0 in any of these equation then the stress field then the stress field will blow up. That means that obviously, there is a singularity at the center of the dislocation line and uh, these equations are not valid in this region. Therefore, we have to understand that the validity of these equations is beyond the core region of the dislocation. And uh, so, we will see the plot of these equations to understand how these stress fields look and how uh, we can understand later on how these stress fields interact with other uh, stress fields in present in a material. So, obviously, we, we cannot talk about singular stresses in a real material because it cannot bear very high stresses. Now, uh, the, these dislocation stress fields become very important when I talk about uh, uh, its interaction with other materials, but we have to remember that first thing this dislocation stress field would uh, interact with with those originating from an externally applied force or from other stress fields which are present within the material. So, these two aspects determine the motion of the dislocation leading to many aspects of mechanical behavior of the dislocation. So, two kinds of stress fields we have to uh, sub separate the ones which I externally applied which can get transmitted now to the dislocation and therefore, cause its motion or can cause uh, it to cross slip or one of those phenomena 
the second thing I need to worry about the internal stresses present in the material from before and these internal stresses can come from uh, as I pointed out many other kind of defects like coherent precipitates etcetera and these interactions finally, the external and internal would determine uh, if this dislocation for instance is going to move on which slip plane is going to move and therefore, the plastic behavior or the evolution of this uh, system with dislocations with time. In these equations we have written down here we assume that the material is isotropic uh, the equations get little more complicated when you are assuming an anisotropic material property, but just to for now we will assume isotropic property. So, that we have to deal with only two fundamental constants g and nu which will now completely describe the elastic behavior or the elastic uh, stress field uh, in this case of the dislocation. Um, we have to of course, understand that real crystals are actually anisotropic and therefore, if you are talking about a single cubic uh, single crystal which is cubic uh, like a copper or any one of those uh, sodium chloride, uh, then we need to put in at least 3 elastic constants in the case of cubic and if the symmetry of the crystal is lower, then we need to fit in more and more elastic constants which will now describe the elastic behavior of the material. For now, in these lecture series we will assume that the material is isotropic and uh, of course, the degree of error introduced by assuming this isotropic would depend on the uh, degree of anisotropy in the material, but nevertheless these can quite a bit describe the at least the essential or the qualitative features of the stress field. Now, if you look at the plot of these stress fields on the left hand side is the sigma x x plot and the other stress plot on the right hand side the sigma y y plot. Now, we note that uh, we are already noted that I should not try to understand these stress fields very close to the dislocation line. In other words, very close to the dislocation line which I show here where the dislocation is present these, these equations are no longer valid which I call the core region of the dislocation. Looking at the sigma x x field, I can see that the completely above this entire region is tensile and the region below the mid plane is all compressive. So, the middle region of course, is line at the center which is the 0 line. So, this is my 0 line. So, there is an half space which is completely compressive and there is an half space which is completely tensile as with respect to the sigma x x stress field. If you look at the sigma y y stress field, you can see that there are many regions of interest that uh, in this region it is uh, you can see the green colors are all the positive stress field green and the uh, so you can see here this is the 0 line somewhere here in the stress field. So, the blues hues are all the uh, negative or the compressive and the uh, green ones and the red ones for instance these these regions are all tensile. So, we can have uh, the sigma x and sigma y plots and obviously, if I want to correlate my sigma x x plot with the presence of the extra half plane, the extra half plane is in the compressive region of the stress field. So, this is my compressive region wherein my extra half plane is present. So, now this is the typical plot of an sigma x and you can you can uh, in fact, correlate it with this characteristic butterfly kind of a shape and the important point to note is that the stresses are in the core of the dislocation or very near the dislocation line or of the order of giga Pascals. So, you can see this is about if you look at the line between the uh, yellow and the red which you can locate here between the yellow and the red you can see it is about about a half a giga Pascal. Now, the reason that it is very interesting that uh, actually now I am describing uh, uh, a dislocation with which with very high stress fields and these are the self stresses of the dislocation and because dislocations are the very agents which cause plasticity by slip this high stress fields cannot uh, in other words it is uh, it is not a very valid kind of argument to talk about plasticity being caused by these stress fields. Now, what is the role that this dislocation plays? One of the important roles that this dislocation stress field would play would be its interaction with other defects in the materials and we will take up those interactions one by one. The most important of them being interaction with other dislocations in the material. Now, if I have two dislocations in on a slip plane, so also you can see in the figure below that there are uh, there is the slip plane which is marked in dashed blue line and you have a positive edge dislocation present on the left hand side and a negative edge dislocation present on the right hand side. Then because of these presence of these stress fields this dislocation can interact with each other and as you know the one dislocation would have a compressive region at the top. So, this is my compressive region of the first dislocation and the compressive region of the other dislocation would be present here and therefore, the compressive region of this dislocation be attracted to the tensile region of the other dislocation and vice versa and therefore, these two dislocations one positive and one negative would actually be attracted. On the other hand, if both the dislocations had the same sign 
assuming that this is a positive there is also would be a positive dislocation and in, uh, still I am discussing only the edge dislocations. Therefore, these two dislocation would actually repel each other. So, if I try to bring these two dislocations to towards each other in the first set. So, this is my case A the attractive case and the case B which is my repulsive case in case A the energy of the system would reduce as these two dislocations come to get towards each other and in case B I need to actually apply more stresses to drive these dislocations towards each other and in case B the energy of the system would increase as these dislocations came towards each other. Uh, now, Uh, so, we have considered the simplest of the cases things can get extremely complicated for instance I can have one dislocation with a slip plane here and then another dislocation with a slip plane here. Then you would have various regions in which there is an attraction and dislocation actually you can divide them into many many quadrants depending on the angle between. So, now you have an x offset and an y offset between these two dislocations and you can start drawing entire regions where they will be attractive or repulsive interaction. So, let us start with the simplest of this in this case so that we can know that dislocations can attract each other and what would happen in this case if these two dislocations came together in this picture and we will also see if there is if if the force of attraction crosses the pulse force then these two dislocations can spontaneously move towards each other and actually come together and cancel each other. So, in this case they will they can actually lead to a cancellation that means a full plane would be present instead of an extra half plane and therefore, the dislocation would vanish. So, this system is a reduction energy system and this dislocation system is a repulsive system and obviously, as you have pointed out we can actually take a more complicated cases where one dislocation has a certain orientation other dislocation has a certain other orientation in the crystal and find out the interactions. Uh, but in these cases we will not have well defined analytical formula or it the ease of calculation may not be that easy, that simple. Uh, we will take up other interactions of dislocations other kind of defects very soon before that let us take up dislocations and cubic close pack crystals. In cubic close pack crystals we know that the slip system consists of a dislocation in a on a close pack plane along a close pack direction. So, the Burgers vector will be a close pack plane on a close uh, close pack direction on a close pack plane. Now, uh, so of course, this is the family which I am indicating here suppose I am talking about a specific Burgers vector like for instance, B can now be for instance I can take a specific value that it can be 1 1 bar 0 then such a uh, Burgers vector will be present on a slip plane like 1 1 1 and now if I take my dot product between the two you can see that is 0 that means that this direction is contained in this plane. In uh, uh, CCP crystals or the cubic close pack crystals perfect dislocations uh, have a tendency to split into partials to lower their energy. So, th there are two kind of partials which are found in CCP crystals one is known as the Shockley partial another is the Frank partial. So, in this context of splitting of the dislocation to lower its energy we will consider the Shockley partial which we will see very soon. Uh, the, two, the region between the two partials on the slip plane is a region which we call the stacking fault and this stacking fault is a two dimensional defect and is associated with the stacking fault energy. So, when the, uh, the two Shockley partials will tend to repel each other and try, and try to be as far between each other, but if the distance between the two partials increases then the stack uh, the faulted region increases and therefore, it costs more energy to the crystal and there will be an equilibrium between the um, two opposing forces. Now, so this is what I am saying here that the two partials repel each other and want to be as far as possible, but this leads to a larger faulted area and will lead to an increase in energy De and depending on the stacking fault energy there will be an equilibrium separation between the partials. So, so and of course, we will consider this a little more detail, but for now let me draw them schematically like this suppose I had a full dislocation line. So, this is my slip plane and I have a full dislocation line and this full dislocation line at a node splits into partials. So, the region between the partials so for instance this is my full Burgers vector B and we will see that this splits into partials. So, the region between the two is my stacking fault and we will take up the stacking fault when we talk about uh, two dimensional defects, but for now just remember this is a fault which costs which is a two, two dimensional defect which costs energy and therefore, even though these two partials repel each other. So, the tendency of these two partials to stay as far apart as possible, but still because now if they go far apart it costs more energy to the system there will be an equilibrium separation between the partials. 
and there are materials which have a high stacking fault energy and there are materials which have a low stacking fault energy. Suppose you have high stacking fault energy then the partials will be close and if you have a low stacking fault energy the partials will be far apart as, com as compared to a material in which a stacking fault energy is high. So, example of a high stacking fault energy would be aluminum and example with a low stacking fault energy would be something like copper. So, we will talk about that more in a in the case uh, about the stacking faults in when we consider two dimensional defects. So, let us consider the configuration of these partials in the case of an cubic close pack crystal. So, in the cubic close pack crystal as you can see the Burgers vector is the red vector shown in this figure and typically it is uh, it is one of the members of the 1, 1 bar half 1 bar 1 0 family. Now, the dislocation line um, the extra half plane you can see in this figure is an 1 bar 1 1 bar 0 extra half plane and the slip system is 1 1 1. Therefore, we know that the dislocation line vector the T vector has to be of the type 1 bar 1 bar 2. In this case specific example it is the 1 bar 1 bar 2 it could be any of the depending on the family of the uh, slip system actually the member of the family you are considering it could be one of the 1 1 2 kind of a vector. Therefore, this 1 bar 1 bar 2 is contained in the uh, 1 1 1 plane and the 1 bar 1 1 bar 0 plane. So, 1 1 bar 0 plane being the extra half plane, the slip plane being the 1 1 1 plane and therefore, the intersection of the 2 is my line vector for the edge dislocation. So, this diagram shows you the geometry of the extra half plane for a full dislocation in the cubic close pack crystal. Now, an important point to be noted which we will uh, is that actually this Burgers vector now actually is an crystal lat translation vector that means, it connects one point one lattice point to the other lattice point in the crystal, but this corresponds this Burgers vector corresponds to two extra half planes. So, this Burgers vector is associated with the insertion of a crystal plane which is indicated in green, but this crystal plane actually consists of two atomic planes and when these two atomic planes separate out from each other we have the two partials in the case of an few edge dislocation. So, what are the partials and what are the kind of vectors they are and what is the physical significance. So, let us start with the equation first that the full Burgers vector is 1 bar 1 0 half 1 bar 1 0 which connects my uh, atom in the corner to the atom in the center which corresponds to a full Burgers vector. Now, this lies on the 1 1 1 slip plane. Now, this can split into two partials which are now the Stockley partials and the vector associated with the Shockley partial is 1 6 1 bar 2 1 bar which lies on the 1 1 1 plane and the 2 bar 1 1 which also lies on the 1 1 1 plane. So, how can we confirm this lies on the 1 1 1 plane? So, we make a dot product for instance. So, this uh, I have to make a dot product between now the 2 bar 1 1 plane direction lying on the 1 1 1. So, I multiply 2 into 1 bar it is 2 bar plus 1 into 1 1 plus 1 into 1 1 which is equal to 0. So, this tells me that this Burgers vector or this partials Burgers vector 2 bar 1 1 lies on the 1 1 1 plane. So, you have two um, members of the 1 2 1 type of a uh, direction which lie on the 1 1 plane which form the Burgers vectors for the partial dislocation. Now, let us see if, uh, if I can satisfy my reaction completely. So, that you can verify by checking that you have here 1 sixth minus 1 6 plus minus 2 6 so that makes it minus 3 6 which is minus 1 so you can see that this is minus 1 by 2 minus half which is what is the Burgers vector here similarly you can confirm that this dislo dislocation reaction is valid but would this why would this dislocation reaction take place that is actually to reduce the dislocation energy so let us confirm that actually the dislocation energy is less if i now do the b square for this and the b square for this so i have suppose i call this the b2 and I call this the B 3. Now, the sum of B 2 square plus B 3 square is one third and the sum of B the B 1 square is half you can see that half is clearly larger than one third. Therefore, this dislocation reaction goes in the forward direction to reduce the energy of the crystal. Now, what is the significance of these two vectors which we have shown here of course, vectoral addition of these two vectors gives the first vector as the simplest of the lot, but we need to understand the physical significance of these two vectors in the cubic close pack crystal. So, what does my uh, B 1 connect B 1 connects a lattice position to another lattice position and in the language of the 
uh, close packing we can call this the A position being connected to another A position on the slip plane. Of course, I can draw uh, this A to A connection as a vector here or equivalently I can draw it like a vector which is shown here the red vector which joins drawn here. Now, if I superimpose on these the other two vectors the B 2 and the B 3 the B 2 vector will be the blue vector which is 1 6 2 bar 1 1 and it is shown here in this dislocation in this triangle also the same thing. So, this is now my uh, red vector which is now my half 1 bar 1 0 which is my red vector and now this is splitting into two partials the blue vector and the green vector which have 1 to 1 kind of 1 6 1 to 1 kind of a indices. But physically this 1 6 1 2 bar 1 1 vector connects now suppose I call these the A positions then these positions the starting point of the blue vector will be the B position and the ending point would be the C position and therefore, my blue vector which is 1 6 2 bar 1 1 would connect my B position to the C position and the green vector would connect the C position to the B position. So, what I have done here I have taken the A to A connection vector and translated so that it superimposes on the B to uh, C kind of a vector. So, this is my B to B kind of a vector and these two blue vector blue and the green vectors take the B to the C position and C to the B position. So, these uh, blue and green vectors when they are superimposed on the 1 1 plane along with the atoms uh, make it clear that what is the physical significance of these two vectors on the slip plane with respect to the CCP crystal. So, to summarize uh, the important features of the partial dislocations in cubic close pack crystals that the slip system is obviously uh, the close pack plane 1 1 1 and the close pack direction lying on it which is the 1 1 0 kind of a vector which I have shown in this diagram as the red vector. So, there are uh, as you can see there are many members to this family and it can be any one of those members, but only thing is that it has to be a close pack plane and a close pack direction lying on it. Now, the energy of this vector P 1 square is about is half B 1 square is half and this would tend to split into partials of the type 1 6 1 2 1 and this would lead to a reduction in energy of the crystal. And these 1 6 1 2 1 type of vectors actually connect the B to the C position and C to the B position along the 1 1 1 plane. So, this is the physical significance of these two vectors as far as the cubic close pack crystal goes. Now, uh, when such a splitting takes place and of course, another way to understand is that if suppose this were a pure edge dislocation I was talking about then I can understand that this red vector the full dislocation vector um, and the associated extra half plane the 1 1 bar 0 plane the green plane in this case is actually a crystal plane, but it consists of two atomic planes and when you form two partials these two atomic planes separate out and lead to partial Burgers vectors like 1 2 1 once that is the 1 6 1 2 1. So, um, and this splitting is made feasible because there is a reduction in energy as the dislocation splits into partials. Now, um, we had talked about another kind of a disloc uh, partial in the cubic close pack crystal which is called a frank partial dislocation and let me draw these frank partial dislocation by considering suppose these were my 1 1 1 planes and now you know that the repeat distance suppose I will call this A, B, C and so forth. Suppose in this case I introduce a now a small region of extra atoms for and suppose from here I introduce so this is my extra row of atoms then the planes around this would be distorted. And as you go far away from this you will find that the distortion comes less and therefore, you will have perfect planes far away from this small segment. Looking down on the plane, so this is nothing but a disk of atoms which I have introduced inside the crystal. Now, this kind of a this is nothing this kind of a dislocation has a Burgers vector of one third one 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 type and obviously, this is not a uh, glycyl dislocation as in the case of the Shockley partials and so this disk of atoms leads to a dislocation loop. So, the boundary of this disk of atoms is the dislocation loop which is the frank partial dislocation. So, this is a frank partial dislocation and so these are the close pack planes viewed edge on when I am trying to understand them. Instead of actually introducing an uh, a disk of atoms actually I can do an experiment where I remove a disk of atoms and that would also lead to a so this 
again is the missing portion of the original plane of atoms again this would lead to in plane along the slip plane if I look. So, I will see this is a partial this is a region where the disk is absent and therefore, this is also a frank partial. Um, so, this would be an intrinsic frank partial dislocation wherein I remove a, a, a disk of atoms and this would be an extrinsic frank partial wherein I introduce a uh, disk of atoms and you can notice that the Burgers vector for this partial is one third one 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 and it does not lie on the slip plane. So, these frank partials can be viewed as dislocation loops and in, in this context it is very important to note that when I have when we consider a mixed dislocation lying on the slip plane that does means a dislocation which is curved for instance could even be a complete loop or a segment which is curved then then such a dislocation which is curved had a mixed character from point to point. But those kind of dislocations are different from these kind of dislocation because now this is a pure edge dislocation which is curved. Therefore, it is possible to have curved dislocations that are pure edge character while it is not possible to have a pure screw dislocation which is curved and in that case the uh, dislocation lied on the slip plane and in this case it does not lie on the slip plane and it is not glissile. So, after having considered uh, frank partial dislocation and dislocation loops in FCC material let us see what is the configuration of a edge dislocation in a BCC crystal. In a BCC crystal now, my VCC crystal does not have distinct close pack planes as in the case of uh, cubic close pack crystal. In this case, um, as we shall see later, that more than one kind of plane could be competing to be part of the slip system. But nevertheless, in VCC crystal, there is a close pack direction which is the 1 1 1 direction, and therefore, the fundamental or the shortest lattice translation vector is this vector which I have shown here, which of the half 1 1 1 type. Therefore, the dislocation Burgers vector is constant, it is definitely half 1 1 1, but the slip plane depending on of course, the uh, kind of crystal all uh, which I have to take into account that and one of the possible slip uh, planes is 1 1 bar 0, but there is no well defined high density plane or a close pack plane and therefore, the slip system in some of the crystals can actually the slip plane can actually change. So, in this case where is my extra half plane, my extra half plane is perpendicular to my uh, Burgers vector and the dislocation line and this is uh, the extra half plane is shown here and the dislocation line is along the 1 1 bar 2 direction which is shown here geometrically. So, this is my extra half plane which is now the 1 1 1 plane it lies and this intersects my slip plane which is 1 1 bar 0 along the 1 bar 1 bar 2 kind of a direction. But the Burgers vector is a constant which is along the close pack direction in the BCC crystal which is 1 1 1. So, this is also shown in the plan view wherein now this is my dislocation line vector which is here this is my Burgers vector and my extra half plane is the one which is green which is coming out from this plane of the board. Now, let us proceed uh, take up at least a few examples of dislocations and ionic crystals. Um, now, in dislocations suppose I am talking about an edge dislocation in an ionic crystal. Um, if I have an extra half plane containing only uh, of one kind of species for instance it could be just for a sodium chloride crystal if I have a dislocation having only sodium atoms then obviously, this is a not a neutral condition and this is not a stable condition. And we have to remember for instance in the example below the, the Burgers vector has to be a full lattice translation vector and therefore, B in this case is 1 0 0 and not the vector connecting the uh, C s atom to the C l atom. So, that is not a full Burgers vector in sodium chloride which is an F c c lattice which has an F c c lattice the Burgers vector is half 1 1 0 and it cannot be half 1 0 0. Because now the Burgers vector connects one lattice position to another even in ionic crystals the Burgers vectors tend to be large in ionic crystals and therefore, uh, they cost more energy to be introduced in an ionic crystal. For instance, in copper the Burgers vector is about 2.55 uh, angstroms if you compare it with sodium chloride it is about 4 angstroms and therefore, it is a large Burgers vector costing lot of energy. So, the simple rule for ionic crystals is that the, lat, uh, the Burgers vector has to connect one lattice position to the other and therefore, cannot connect the position uh, in one sub lattice occupied one by one kind of ion to another sub lattice which is occupied by another kind of an ion. The next question we ask ourselves how come dislocations are present in a crystal in other words how do dislocations form in a crystal. So, uh, there are many many methods by which a dislocation can form and uh, of course, uh, one of the easiest or the simplest to visualize is the 
they are due to accidents in crystal growth from the melt. So, suppose I have a molten metal and I am solidifying it, this solidification process is not perfect and you could have a dislocation if which is in the crystal. Uh, later on we will see actually a constructive role of a dislocation where dislocation themselves play a role in crystal growth. So, that is a different issue, but we will come to it very soon a very interesting kind of a role. When you do mechanical deformation of a crystal, high stress concentrations locally can lead to the nucleation of a dislocation. And uh, nucleation of dislocation suppose homogeneously has to take place, then this requires very high stresses of the order of, of tenth of the shear modulus of the crystal. But if there are certain other stress concentrators in the crystal, then this can aid in the nucleation of a dislocation within the crystal, which can take place during plastic deformation. That means, uh, externally applied stresses. And the important point to note is that dislocation density increases during plastic deformation, mainly due to the multi pre, uh, multiplication of the pre existing dislocations. And in other words, overall the number of dislocation of the dislocation density is actually increasing. And we will also see some of the mechanisms by which such an increase in dislocation density is possible in a crystal. So, um, so a dislocation can come from um, some of these sources which are mentioned here. Uh, additionally, we will later on talk about uh, certain kind of dislocations which we call the structural dislocations. We had already seen that when you have a defect, there can be random defects or there can be structural defects. So, in the case of structural dislocations, uh, their origin could be very different. For instance, when you have a for instance uh, a phenomena wherein of recovery, then when if in other words when you take a cold work crystal and you recover the crystal there could actually be a small reduction in dislocation density, but additionally you could have an array of dislocation developing into a what you may call a low angle boundary. And in that case uh, this process is taking place in the during recovery of a cold work metal. So, those kind of uh, origins are slightly different from the multiplication we are talking about here. So, what is the typical value of dislocation uh, density in a material? So, if you take a, as we have seen that dislocation density is defined as length of a dislocation line in a volume of a material. And in annealed crystal this value is typically about it can be even lower for instance can even be for instance 10 power 4 or 10 power 5 meter per meter cube, but in a cold work crystal typically it rises to about 10 power 12 meter per meter cube. So, there are methods or there are processes active which actually lead to the increase in dislocation density as you are plastically deform the deforming the material. This is actually a very surprising aspect because we know that the first step of plastic deformation is the motion of a dislocation leaving the crystal. So, if dislocations are leaving the crystal during plastic deformation how is the density increasing? So, we will consider at least some examples or one example of how a dislocation density can increase during plastic deformation. So, this is a very surprising aspect and we will also consider the constructive role of screw dislocations in crystal growth very soon. Now, what is the Burgers vector of dislocations in cubic crystals? Uh, we know that uh, it has to be a fundamental or the shortest lattice translation vector. So, from crystallography we know that in monotonic monoatomic FCC it is half 110, in monoatomic BCC it is half 111, in simple cubic it has to be 100, in sodium chloride type structure which is now belongs to FCC lattice it is 110 and the CSCL structure which is a simple cubic has to have 100 and the diamond cubic structure which is an FCC lattice also has to have similar to the monoatomic FCC which is half 110. So, the uh, in cubic crystals the Burgers vector is easy to determine. So, if you look at the slip system and uh, here in we already considered the FCC case where the slip systems is 111 type of plane and the a vector 110 type of vector lying on the slip plane, but the important example in this and in this um, HCP the close pack plane is the basal plane and this is a close pack direction lying on the slip plane which is of the type 1 1 2 bar 0 which is now forming the slip system. The interesting point to be no, to be noted in this slide is the case of the BCC crystal which does not have any close pack planes and we already seen the example of the 1 1 0 kind of a slip plane the geometry of that, but there could be other slip planes like uh, 1 1 2 or 1 2 3 which have a slightly lower density as atomic density as compared to the 1 1 0 plane, but these could also be slip planes but nevertheless the slip direction remains constant which is of the 1 1 1 type. So, in fact, I should use a different arrow for this case. So, if I am using this plane, so, so this has to be of the 1 1 1 type which is the slip direction in a BCC crystal. Now, we have considered so far uh, mostly either uniformly curved dislocations or 
dislocations which are straight. Now, there are possibilities wherein a dislocation line has a small defect in it and these there are two kinds of defects which are possible in a straight edge dislocation or a straight screw dislocation and these defects are the jogs and the kinks. And this is interesting to note that jogs and kinks are not defects themselves, they, are, they can be visualized as defect in a defect. So, they are a defect within the dislocation line. So, what is a jog? A jog is a case wherein a jog moves a dislocation line out of the slip plane, the current slip plane to one which is parallel while a kink leaves a dislocation line on the slip plane. So, the figure on the left shows a jog wherein now my dislocation line which is present on this upper blue plane goes to the lower blue plane and this region is the jog in the dislocation line. In the case of a kink, the dislocation lines remains on the slip plane, but nevertheless there is a sort of a sharp bend in the dislocation line and this is called a kink and if this is my slip plane, then these kinks might be glissile and they can move along the slip plane. Now, uh, to reiterate there are two ways, uh, two kind of defects which are important when uh, and many of the as we shall see later that these jogs and kinks actually can be produced by dislocation reactions. That means, if two straight dislocation interact with each other you can actually have a production of a jog or a kink and in the case of a jog a dislocation line moves out of the slip plane into a parallel one while in the case of a kink the dislocation remains in the slim plane. Uh, kinks have an additional important role with regard to the lowering of stress with respect to the ideal uh, shear stress of a crystal. We had in the beginning of this topic we had made a, or this chapter on dislocations we had made a calculation wherein we had said that if if you want to deform a entire crystal by applying shear then the shear stress required which is the theoretical shear stress would be all the order of the giga pascals. And we noticed that with the presence of dislocation we actually weakens the crystal, but there could be a second step in this whole thought process which can lead to a further weakening of the crystal and which is we will consider later is the formation of something known as the double kink mechanism. So, kinks have an additional role with respect to weakening of the crystal or causing plasticity in certain kind of crystals. Um, jogs and kinks in screw dislocation of edge character, um, jog in an edge dislocation has edge character and kink in a screw dislocation has screw character. So, that character table has been summarized here. So, if you have a jog in an edge dislocation it will have edge character and if you have a jog in a screw dislocation it will have edge character. On the other hand a kink in an edge dislocation has screw character and a kink in a screw dislocation has edge character. In other words except for the kink in the edge dislocation all the others have edge character to them. So, this is important note because now this small segment which is a jog or a kink uh, can be of different character as compared to the original dislocation itself. In other words kink in an edge dislocation can have an screw character and this is something important to note. So, this table gives us a character table for the jogs and kinks in straight dislocations. Um, we will briefly consider the energy of a jog and uh, obviously, the presence of a and the important point to note is obviously, the fact that the presence of a jog in a dislocation line straight dislocation line increases the energy of a dislocation and, uh, but the jogs energy per unit length is comparatively less compared to the straight dislocation. Though the extra length produced by the jog costs you energy, but that length energy is lower as compared to the normal dislocation energy is something to be noted. Therefore, whenever you have plastic deformation and jogs or kings are being produced in the dislocation, then this costs energy to the dislocation and this is perhaps obvious because now we are actually increasing the dislocation line length. An important point uh, uh, to be noted is that this, these jogs and kinks can actually be produced by dislocation dislocation interactions. And uh, though it is uh, perhaps not uh, uh, this kind of an interaction would be more appropriate to be taken up in detail in the case uh, in a course on plasticity, but nevertheless we will from the structural material structural materials point of view it is worthwhile to note the kind of uh, interactions which can lead to the formation of jogs and kinks in a dislocation line. And as we had seen that these uh, production of jogs and kinks in the dislocation line cost you extra energy. That means that it also requires extra stress in the to be applied to cause continued plasticity when such kind of a defects are forming on the dislocation line. So, what are the kind of dislocation interaction I can consider and how they can lead to the um, formation of this jogs and kinks. So, we will take up four cases 
the first one being an edge edge inter intersection or interaction between an intersection between an edge and an edge dislocation which have perpendicular burgers vector. So, let us consider two edge dislocation and the extra half plane shall be shown in grey colour and the two slip planes are marked in green and blue colour. So, now I have in this case the green dislocation line with a shown with a green burgers vector moving downwards towards the slip plane which contains now my blue dislocation line with a burgers vector B2. So, when this dislocation interacts interacts with this, this horizontal dislocation line on which you have the burgers vector B1 imposed. In other words now, this horizontal dislocation line gets a jog in, in its length. That means, now, now it gets jogged the dislocation line and no longer it is present on a single blue plane, but it is shifted from one blue plane which is shown here to a parallel blue plane connected by a jog. This jog has an edge character and has a length B1 because this length B1 is coming from what this uh, dislocation B1 imposes on this other dislocation which is the blue type of a dislocation. Since B2 is parallel to the dislocation line B1, th this intersection does intersection does not lead to any alteration in the uh, dis green dislocation line because the dislocation line vector B2 is now uh, dislocation burgers vector B2 is now parallel to the dislocation line the, of the green dislocation. Therefore, this intersection does not alter the green dislocation in any way, but since this B1 vector is perpendicular to the dislocation line blue dislocation line, it leaves a jog as the dislocation moves along its slip plane. So, first among these interaction I am considering is an edge edge interaction in which a green dislocation with B1 vector travelling on a green slip plane is intersecting with a blue dislocation uh, that means blue dislocation line having a blue vector B2 drawn in blue colour along a blue slip plane. This intersection leaves the B1 dislocation uh, or the dislocation with B1 above as vector unaltered while the dislocation which is blue in colour has a jog produced on its dislocation line. So, this is an important point to be noted when one two edge dislocation with a perpendicular burgers vector intersect with each other. So, you have one unaffected another having a jog along its dislocation line length. You have two edge dislocation interacting, but with parallel burgers vector. So, in this case you can see that there is one green dislocation and as usual the as before the extra half plane has been marked in grey and the blue dislocation you can see that both the dislocations get kinked. So, the edge dislocation 1 which had originally a burgers vector B1 has a kink in it of screw character. So, B1 dislocation develops this kink and this kink has a screw character because this kink is parallel to the vector B1. So, therefore, it is of screw character. The other dislocation which is now my dislocation 2 with burgers vector B2 which is now this burgers vector also develops a kink. In other words, uh, the green vector B1 imposes itself on the blue vector uh, blue dislocation line and the B2 imposes itself on the green dislocation line and therefore, you have double kink formation. And you can see that uh, this kink is parallel to B2 the green, uh, green kink on the green line and the kink on the blue line is parallel to B1. And this kink the second kink is also of screw character because now it is again parallel to the vector B2. So, you have two kinks being produced when a two edge dislocations intersect with each other and both the kinks are of screw character and these kinks can glide on their respective slip planes. So, these are glissile kinks and therefore, the kind of hardening that these kind of kinks give during plastic deformation is less as compared to the kind of hardening uh, which uh, those kind of kinks or jogs which cannot glide on the slip plane. Now, next we consider as an edge screw interaction and in this case you have a screw dislocation which is which has a burgers vector B1, B2 and which is has a dislocation line shown in green. The edge dislocation has extra half plane shown in grey and has a burgers vector B1. This is before the interaction and after the interaction you can see that the edge dislocation develops a jog and this jog has edge character to it and this jog takes the edge dislocation from 
the one blue plane to another blue plane and the screw dev dislocation develops a kink which is again of edge character. So, this B 1 has been imposed on this B 1 length has been imposed on this screw dislocation, this B 2 length has been imposed on the uh, edge dislocation therefore, you see that it is this small red segment is parallel to B 2 and this small maroon segment is parallel to B 1. So, each of the dislocations has imposed itself on the other dislocation and the jog is and the edge both are of edge character sorry jog and the kink both are of edge character. Now, so to summarize this dislocation reaction you have two edge one edge and one screw in dislocation intera uh, interacting with each other the Burgess vector of these two dislocations are perpendicular to each other. The edge dislocation with a Burgess vector B 1 develops a jog of edge character and the length of this jog is B 2. The screw dislocation with Burgess vector B 2 develops a kink which is of edge character and the length of this kink is B 1. The fourth case is a screw screw interaction in this case again I consider the case of perpendicular Burgess vector between the screw and the screw dislocation and this is a very important kind of interaction from the plastic deformation point of view. Now, uh, as before B 2 will impose itself on the B 1 uh, dislocation line that is dislo this dislocation line and B 1 will impose itself on the other green dislocation line. So, after the dislocation reaction you would notice that there is a jog on both the dis screw dislocations. So, and both these jogs have edge character. So, after the dislocation reaction has taken place. So, there is this uh, one screw dislocation with an edge segment in between which is a jog the other screw dislocation which is a small uh, edge segment which is a jog in the screw dislocation. So, to summarize this dislocation reaction uh, screw dislocation 1 with Burgess vector B 1 has a jog of edge character produced on it and the length of this jog is B 2. On the other screw dislocation 2 uh, which is a Burgess vector B 2 there are again a jog formed of edge character and the length of this jog is B 1. So, this is actually the modulus of the B 1. So, I let I can maybe write it this way. So, I can write this is actually length is the modulus of these Burgess vector. Now, the important point to note is that the both these jogs are non conservative that means they cannot move along with the dislocation line. So, these two this segments act almost like a pinning segment in the dislocation line. These segments which are of screw character can glide freely while this segment which is of edge character cannot glide and would lead to a pinning. So, this is would be a mechanism by which the material would harden in other words this dislocation reaction would produce um, non glacile segments leading to hardening of the material that means this dislocation cannot freely move on the slip plane. 